we're, we're talking about the history of Islam in Africa. Now, when we talk about the history of Islam in Africa, we have to recognize the fact that uh, Africa was in the picture very early in the history of Islam because the first migration of the Muslims was to Ethiopia. And uh, when the Muslims were persecuted in Mecca, the Prophet told his disciples to go to Ethiopia, where you had a Christian king, the Negus, and he welcomed the Muslims. So in the Muslim uh, history books, uh, we talk about Al-Hijra Al-Awwal, the first Hijra was to Abyssinia, uh, as it was known. That provides the earliest connection to Africa with regard to the development of Islam in Africa. Now we know from the historical record that those Muslim migrants or refugees went back and they are known as the boat people uh, who went back in the sources. They are the boat people, people of the boat, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, who went back to uh, join the Prophet in uh, Arabia. Uh, there was a false start when some of them uh, were told that the Prophet reconciled with the unbelievers in Mecca. And of course, that was a false uh, information. And many of them went back to, uh, to Ethiopia. I make this point because there is a connection between Africa and the three Abrahamic religions. Uh, the first one, of course, is Judaism, and the Jews still celebrate their connection with Africa. They don't say it that way. They talk about the Exodus or the Passover, and uh, the connection of Moses uh, leaving, uh, leading the, uh, the Hebrew people out of Egypt to the land of Canaan. That is the first connection between Africa and the Abrahamic religions. And of course, the Seder celebration of the Jews uh, revisit that issue every year. Uh, the movement from Egypt to the land of uh, Canaan. The second connection, of course, which is part of this pattern of relationship between Africa and the Abrahamic religions, is the flight of Jesus and his parents to Egypt when Herod decided to kill all the young babies, boys, because he was told that one of them would be the king of the Jews. And of course, this is in the gospel. So, that provides the other linkage between the African continent and a second uh, Abrahamic religion. And of course, they started out with the third one, that is the Muslim migration into Ethiopia. So there is that connection between the Abrahamic religions and the continent of Africa with regard to the founders of these religions linking with Africa at one point at the very beginning of their society, I mean, of their religious movement. But when we talk about the history of Islam in Africa, really, we do not focus generally on the early migration because the Muslims were refugees and they did not really do da'wah among the Christians in Ethiopia to the point that you had Christians who became... Now, there is in the Muslim tradition that the Negus became a Muslim. That is a Muslim folktale. I mean, you know, but the reality is that Islam went into Egypt as a conquering force. Once the Islamic movement became dominant in the Arabian Peninsula, it moved northwards towards what we now call Israel, Jordan, and Iraq, and Syria. And of course, all those areas were Christian lands in the pre-Islamic period, but gradually they became Islamized. The same thing was true in southern part of Arabia, where you had Christian and Jewish enclaves in what is now called Yemen. And of course, in Najran, which was a major Christian center, Arab Christians existed in that part of Arabia long before Islam. And there were Jewish settlements in Yemen. And of course, we saw evidence of that when Israel was created. Some of the Yemeni Jews went to Israel. So you find that there was a Christian and Jewish presence in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. And of course, long before Islam, long before Christianity, uh, 
there was this connection between the people in the northeastern part of Africa, we call them Ethiopian Somalis, and the people who live in that region. And you can see the linguistic connection between the Arabs and the Jews on the one hand, and some of those African groups along the northeast African coast, uh, which is bordering the Red Sea. And that's one of the reasons why linguistically people in that part of the world are usually called Afro-Semitic linguistically. They speak Amhara, Tigrinya, and all those languages. Now, it is against this background that you can understand how and why Islam gradually crossed the Red Sea into Africa because there were already pre-existing ties and connections through trade and commerce and through travels between people living on the western part of the Red Sea and people living on the eastern part of the Red Sea. Once the Islamic movement became dominant in Arabia and moved forward to occupy areas called Palestine, what we now call Jordan, Israel, uh, Syria, and uh, uh, Lebanon, and all those areas, Islam gradually moved westward, and this resulted in the conquest of Egypt. Again, here you have to look at the context uh, of Islamic penetration of Egypt. Egyptian civilization of the pharaohs had already waned and disappeared. And the Egyptians were dominated by waves after waves of foreign invaders, going back to the, uh, the Assyrians uh, who were able to defeat the Egyptians because they discovered the use of iron. And of course, that changed the warfare in the Middle East and in the region, just like the atomic bomb changed the nature of warfare uh, in world history. So the discovery of iron by the Assyrians turned the table against the Egyptians. And of course, the Egyptians would later recover, just like the Russians would get the weapon, atomic bomb later on uh, after the United States had an advantage uh, briefly. The same thing happened in human history. I mean, the Assyrians who were able to conquer the Egyptians uh, destroy uh, the Pharaonic culture, and of course they would be replaced as the power play in the Mediterranean uh, and, the, and the Middle Eastern part of the world changed. The Assyrians would be overcome by the Babylonians, and of course the Babylonians will become rulers over Egypt, and of course uh, and Egypt would be a province of Cyrus the Great, and then of course later on the, the Babylonians themselves will collapse like all dominant powers in history and would be replaced by the Greeks, Alexander the Great. And of course, Egypt would be part of the Ptolemites, you see, because once Alexander died, his two generals divided his empire into two. The Seleucids took, take, took over Syria and the Eastern Wing, and then of course the Ptolemites took Egypt. I give this historical background because I don't want to convey the impression that when Islam came, there was nothing in Egypt. There was a historical background in Egypt. And by the time the Muslim came, the Greeks had been replaced by the Romans. And of course, the Roman Empire would then be taken over by the Christians because by the time Islam appeared in the horizon, Christianity was already established as the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. And Christianity was very much embedded in Egyptian society because some of the early founders of the Christian church came out of Egypt. Uh, and uh, the very trinity itself <laughs> was put forth by an Egyptian uh, who, uh, who, 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 who was able to get uh, the, uh, the, the general uh, leadership of what was then the Catholic church uh, before the Reformation. Now, this background is very important in order to understand the coming of Islam in the region because when the Muslim armies rolled across uh, the, the Red Sea into Egypt, there was a government which was Roman, but Eastern Roman, called the Byzantines. Because once the Roman Empire collapsed, after it was invaded by Attila the Hunt, the center of gravity of the Roman Empire moved east. And of course, that's why you have Constantinople, which is now called Istanbul. And of course, the Christian Eastern wing of the Roman Empire that were governing the Mediterranean controlled Egypt. Uh, 
That is the background. When Islam entered Egypt, there was a Byzantine dynasty governing Egypt. And of course, the people who were living in Egypt were not very happy with the Byzantine rulers. And historians would say that there was some connivance on the part of the Christians in Egypt with the Arab armies to facilitate the conquest of Egypt. And of course, these Muslim armies were able to conquer Egypt. And of course, the majority of the people will continue to be Christian. And there were some sizable number of Jews in Egypt at that time. And these Christian and Jews who became part of this newly constructed Arab Muslim empire uh, would gradually convert to Islam over time. And of course, this would set the stage for the expansion of Islam across North Africa. Now, the Egyptians, you must understand, had their own language, Coptic language, which goes back to Pharaonic Egypt. And of course, the Egyptians were also influenced by the foreign invaders. And they became Greek speakers and Latin speakers. But by the time Islam came, the Greek speakers were dominant because they were the Byzantines, the Eastern wing. So it's the Arabic language gradually replaced Greek in Alexandria and some of the other areas. And of course, capitals like what we now call Cahira, you know, uh, became uh, new towns that were constructed by the coming of the Mus I mean, by the Muslims. And then, of course, the Muslims will gradually move across North Africa in the establishment of Islamic rule. Now, as you move out of Egypt into what we now call Libya, uh, you are now into Barber territory, the Barbers. The Barbers, of course, have been the dominant people in this part of Africa for several thousand years. And of course, when the Muslim armies came, the Muslims encountered the Berbers who had their own religions, but many of the Berbers have been exposed to Christianity for several centuries and were Christians. They were also Jews living in that part of the continent. Now, gradually, many of these Berbers were converted to Islam. We are told by Ibn Khaldun that the Berbers apostated 12 times before they reconciled themselves with Islam. So it was a long time before they were really Muslims. But then gradually Islam spread among the Berbers and many of these Christian Berbers or animist Berbers became Muslims. And of course the Arabs were able to establish a culture and a civilization in North Africa which gradually absorbed many of these people. Now one thing that the Arabs have in common with the Romans, and this is what differentiated these two empire builders from all the other empire builders, is that like the Romans, when they went to areas, they married the local women. And, uh, and this way, gradually, they were able to penetrate and get these societies under their control. And this is very effective in areas where you have matrilineality, because it's very easy for the invading power to marry into royal families. And in the second, third generation, they'll take over the, 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 these families. The British never did that when they went to other areas. They deliberately stay away from the locals. So this is one big, <laughs> big, big difference between the British and the Romans and the Arabs. I mean, this is one of the uh, uh, differences between the, uh, the civilizations. So as the, 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 the Arabs, be, uh, succeeded in establishing themselves in North Africa, many of these Berber families became assimilated into Arab culture and they gradually took on Arab names. And that's one reason why when you go to North Africa today, many of those North Africans like Muammar Gaddafi and Bouteflika and others will tell you they are Arabs. You know that after a thousand years, they have been mixed up with uh, Arab blood and, and Berber blood. I mean, the language of the Berbers have remained, but I doubt very much whether you genuinely have any Berber who can really claim that he is Berber 100%. They have been mixing. And of course, you have a lot of invaders who came from uh, Europe and uh, other parts of the region. Turks, Circassians, and all those groups 
mixing and intermarrying with them. But the illusion of being an Arab and Berber continues in that region up to the present time. The point I'm trying to make really is that uh, as the, uh, the, the, the Islamic culture spread in North Africa and the people in that part of the world were exposed to Islam, two processes took place in that region. One was Arabization, the other one was Islamization. Now, the Islamization process became very advanced in North Africa from Egypt all the way up to what we now call Morocco. Now, it took many centuries for the Muslim armies to spread across North Africa. It was not a generational. It was several generations before Islam really moved from the east, meaning Egypt in this case, all the way to the Maghreb, meaning Morocco and Al Jazeera, Algeria and all those places. Now, the Arabization process also took time because linguistic expansion doesn't take place in one generation. It took many centuries for Arabic to become dominant in North Africa. Now, while this thing was going on, the Muslims were able to develop their naval power in the region. Now, if you look at the history of the Middle East, you will notice that all these major empires and civilizations that became dominant were able to, do to become dominant because they controlled the land base and the water, the sea lanes. And of course, from a strategic point of view, they were able to dominate the trade routes. And as the Muslims gradually expand across North Africa, they begin to control the strategic points. And this way, Europeans who are interested in trading with the East would become very much dependent on Muslims. And this is very much documented in the historical literature because the Muslims began to control the Mediterranean, they controlled the Red Sea, and they controlled the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, and this gave them advantage. And that's one reason why the Islamic civilization became dominant during that period from the seventh century right up to the age of exploration of Prince Henry the Navigator. During this span of time, the Muslims virtually dominated what was known as world trade because all the silk that were coming from China and the Silk Road was dominated by the Muslims. And all the spices that were coming to Europe passed through Muslim lands. And of course, with Jewish intermediaries and some Christian traders, they were able to be carried into Europe. And North Africa became a very important platform in this Muslim equation, because North Africa is suddenly the land base separating Europe through the Mediterranean from Asia and Africa. And of course, this became very critical as the Muslims began to build a civilization in North Africa. And a number of towns and cities emerged in North Africa, Khairawan, Marrakesh, Slemsen, Tunis, all these different towns that you now see on the map in North Africa gradually developed. There were towns that existed like Carthage during the Carthaginian period when people we now call Lebanese today, we call them Lebanese, but they were Phoenicians in those days, moved from what is now called Sidon and Tyre in Lebanon across the Mediterranean to settle in North Africa, what is now called Tunis, to establish Carthage. And that became the Carthaginian civilization, which was the rival civilization to the Romans until the Romans defeated them after the First and Second Punic Wars. Now, what is very interesting here is the fact that when the Arabs took over the region, the global trade that was beginning to develop uh, was done likely through seafaring. Now, of course, you know that the Greeks were good seamen in the region, and the Romans were able to develop their naval power. This was how they were able to conquer Egypt in the first place. So when the Muslims came, the Arabs basically were not seafaring people. The Southern Arabs, as opposed to the Northern Arabs, because you know the Arabs are divided into two groups, those who are the children of Adnan and those who are the children of Hatan. Now, you know, like uh, those Arabs from the South, in what we now call Yemen, Oman, and Bahrain area today, 
those Arabs were more into seafaring. They knew the sea, and they developed their own vessels, like the doughboats. So they were very much familiar with the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean, whereas the Arabs to the north, what we now call uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, in, in the Najd and Hejaz area, they were not very much into seafaring, except those who were living closer to the Red Sea. So when the Muslim armies conquered North Africa, they were forced to develop a naval base on the Mediterranean. And of course, this would develop with the Umayyad period. The Umayyad is the first dynasty that came after the four rightly guided caliphs. I'm sure in the history of the life of the prophet, you already went through that. You know, you have Abu Bakr, who ruled for two years after the death of the prophet, from 632 to 634, if you go by the Gregorian calendar. And then, of course, he was succeeded by Omar, who was there for 10 years. And then Omar would be replaced by Usman bin Affan, who was there for 12 years before he was assassinated by some Egyptian mutineers. This provides the connection, showing you that by the time Omar bin had, I mean, uh, Usman bin Affan uh, was the Khalifa, the Egyptians were already under the sway of the Muslims, to the point that they were sufficiently integrated into the Islamic empire that some of them would have the audacity to travel all the way from Egypt, which was a long way, to go and assassinate the head of the country, I mean, the head of the state. So the Muslims under the Umayyad dynasty developed naval bases on the Mediterranean, because that was the only way for them to check enemies north of the Mediterranean and potential enemies east of the Mediterranean. Because you have to remember, for a long time, the Muslims were not in control of what we now call Turkey and countries like Greece. All those countries in the Mediterranean that were Christians were still Christians. It would be only in the 15th century when the Muslims would take over what we now call Istanbul, which was then Constantinople. So you can see that even though the Muslims control much of the Christian lands, what we are former Christian lands like Syria, Iraq, you know, Palestine, you know, uh, Jordan and all those other areas, there were still Christian territories further to the north, known as Byzantium. And of course, it will take many generations before Byzantium would come under Muslim rule. Now, while the Muslims were exercising hegemony over North Africa, there was this urgent need to establish a naval base in that region. And of course, this led to the development of Muslim vessels in the region. And of course, this would also explain how Muslims would move from North Africa into what we call Spain. But we'll come to the Spanish side of the story later on. What I want to show is that it took many centuries for Islam to move from Egypt, which was conquered 40 years after the, end, uh, after the death of the Prophet. And since that time, Egypt and the rest of North Africa would be gradually conquered by the Umayyad. And of course, during the period of the Umayyad, much of North Africa would fall under the control of the Muslims. And of course, the last Muslim conqueror who came close to the Atlantic Ocean is celebrated in Muslim annals, uh, saying that if God, when he, he waded with his horse into the Atlantic and said, if there were land, we will keep on moving. So, I mean, you can see that uh, the Arabs would have come to America head on, long time ago, long before Columbus. I mean, you know, like if there was just land between, between Africa and the Americas, so they would have been here many, many years ago. So, uh, because they were already on the edge of Africa, facing the Atlantic in the 8th century. So, I mean, it will take seven centuries later for Columbus and others to come here. So you can imagine uh, what would have history, world history would have been. But of course, as I told you in my lecture on Islam in America, you have some historians who seem to suggest that they came by boat. If they didn't come over land, they came by boat. Now, the point that needs to be borne in mind here really is that 
the processes of Arabization and Islamization were taking place in the northern part of the continent. You began to see the emergence of towns and cities and cultures, and North Africa became part of that global Islamic network. And of course, Muslims were beginning to import silk into the region from China through the Silk Route. They were beginning to bring spices, as I said earlier, from the East, India, and a host of other trading items were coming from the eastern part of the region. And then at the same time, as the Muslims consolidated their power, not of the Sahara, they also built on the trade routes that were established by the Carthaginians and the Romans in the sub-Saharan trade. Because the Carthaginians were already trading with the people south of the Sahara long before the Arabs came on the scene. But one thing that the Arabs were able to do more successfully than any other group was the fact that the Arabs benefited from their <coughs> civilizational predecessors. In the context of North African history and in terms of the trans-Saharan trade, two things become very important. One is that the Arab, the Romans had much earlier introduced the humpback camel what is known as technically the dromedarian camel, as the technical name for it, or the humpback camel. The Romans had already introduced that into North Africa. But the Romans were not desert people, so they couldn't make much use of the humpback camel to penetrate the Sahara. History would reserve that role for the Arabs, who will use the humpback camel more skillfully and effectively to penetrate the Sahara thereby creating that bridge between sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa. The second point that needs to be borne in mind with regard to the historical expansion of Islam in North Africa and then through the trans-Saharan routes into sub-Saharan regions of Africa was the fact that when the Arabs came into the region, they were able to use the knowledge they have acquired in the Mediterranean world, I mean, in Arabia, to their advantage, because they had these long journeys, caravans, which were established, something that the Romans didn't have. So when the Arabs came, they were able now, not only to use the humber camel, which the Romans had already introduced, but building on this Roman legacy, they were able to benefit from their long history of long distance trade with camels. And of course, this would prepare the stage for the expansion of Islam south of the Sahara. And this is one of the points that needs to be emphasized. It is true that Islam expanded into the areas not of Arabia by conquest. And it is also true that Islam spread across North Africa by conquest. However, Islam did not spread south of the Sahara by conquest. The Arabs did not conquer Africa south of the Sahara and created an Islamic civilization. No, you have a number of processes by which Islam would move from North Africa to the sub-Saharan region of Africa. This is where you have the five agencies by which Islam was spread south of the Sahara. As I pointed out, long before the Arabs came to the scene, you already had the Carthaginians who were there, and they did have some trade. We read in Herodotus, the Greek traveler and writer, that you have the Garamantes, you know, and the, and the Troglodytes, I mean, in that part of uh, the world, and there were connections between the Greeks and the Carthaginians, as we know later on, uh, with people south of the Sahara. Now, from the Roman historians, uh, uh, Greek historians, you know that there were some connections between people at the periphery of the desert and the people who were further to the north of the desert in North Africa. But it was only after the coming of the Arabs that we now begin to see human agency penetrating the Sahara and reaching points south of the Sahara, deep enough. And the Arabs were able now to travel by camel 
for several weeks across the Sahara, which is the largest desert in the world, to point south of the Sahara. And this would lead to the development of several trade routes into sub-Saharan Africa, beginning from Egypt all the way up to Marrakesh in Morocco. You have this number of routes that you can take points from the north to sub-Saharan region. And the Arabs were able to penetrate through these different routes to penetrate. You have the, uh, the Kodofan, Darfur part, you have the Tripoli part, you have the Lamshan part, and then you have part leading into Timbuktu, and then the Marrakesh. Now, what the, uh, the, the, the Arabs were able to do with their knowledge of the camel and their knowledge of traveling across the desert was to develop the, what one British writer called, Evie Bovell called it, the golden trade of the moors. That the Arabs were able now to get gold south of the Sahara to North Africa, to Europe, and to the East. And of course, this made gold a very important item of trade between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. In addition to gold, of course, there was trade in slaves. Just like the Muslims ruling Spain, as we will find out later on, were able to get slaves not only from Africa, south of the Sahara, but from Eastern Europe. Because the English word slave itself is from Slav, the, uh, the, the, the Eastern European language. I mean, the connection that developed between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa in the golden trade entice many adventurers. And that's one of the reasons why in the history of North African Islam, the saying which later became famous in America was an echo of a saying said by Arab parents to their kid, young man, go west. So, I mean, you know, like, uh, the, 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 it started with the Arabs, you know, like, so the, 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 this whole idea of going west. So, I mean, you know, like uh, many of these young Arabs who are living in Arabia or in Cairo would be told to go towards the Maghreb, the West. So, I mean, and of course, the West was the source of making gold, where you can get gold. So, I mean, you know, like uh, if you go to North Africa, I mean, chances are you may be able to join a caravan and go south of the Sahara into sub-Saharan Africa where you had the gold mines. Or you can stay north and trade with those who have gold. So that was that attraction. And of course, later on, the Europeans would be attracted by this information about gold, and that will lead to the conquest of Africa many centuries later. But the point that we need to make here is the fact that as a result of this interaction between sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa, you now have human agency in the form of trade and commerce. And these Arab traders would now become agents for the dissemination of Islam. And as a result of the interaction with African societies south of the Sahara, through what social scientists would call the demonstration effect, because as these Arab traders travel to sub-Saharan Africa, they became the guest of African peoples. And of course, if you look at the literature, what you see is that in the ancient African kingdoms, which had contact with the Arabs, this whole idea of two towns, what we now see very much in America, Spanish town or Chinatown, I mean, that phenomena was very much alive in ancient Ghana. And of course, in Takrur, because what the African rulers did, they separated these foreigners from the locals. Uh, and so the Arabs would live in what they call in the Mande language, Arabuzuo, meaning Arab town, which was always about six to eight kilometers away from the African towns. And some of the polis, anthropologists, I mean, uh, uh, archaeologists <laughs> who have done some investigation into Africa uh, in the uh, ancient Ghana uh, found in the Ghan ancient capital city of ancient Ghana called Kumbisale. They found out in the ruins of Kumbisale these two townships. And what was very interesting about the differences between these two 
is the diet of the two inhabitants. Because in the Arab towns, they found garlic, which was rare or unknown south of the Sahara. So this proves that you did have uh, traders who were coming from the north into this part of the northwestern part of Africa, what is now called southeastern Mauritania and northwestern part of Mali, where the ancient Ghana Empire was located. And of course, Kumbi Saleh was the capital of the region. And you can see <coughs> the diets of the Arabs who came in there as opposed to diets of the local people. And of course, this proved beyond reasonable <coughs> doubt to the archaeologists that this was a site where you have this. <coughs> and it reinforces this two-town arrangement phenomena, where you have one town inhabited by the traders and the other town inhabited it, uh, by the locals. Now, what is very interesting here, really, is that when you look <coughs> at the history of that uh, transaction, uh, you find that these Africans were practicing their own tradition, what Muslims will call these are jahiluns. They are practicing uh, the religion of the jahils, people who are really in a state of ignorance, unexposed to monotheism. And of course, the Africans on their side felt that these people were strangers who practiced a different religion. And of course, the kings and the nobles of the African side had vested interest in this trade because it brought all these luxury goods from the Mediterranean or the East, while at the same time, they were exporting ivory ostrich feathers and other things south of the Sahara going north. And of course, so you can see that through this trade and commerce, Islam began to be exposed to the Africans through demonstration, not through proselytization, but through demonstration, <coughs> because the Africans were now beginning to see the Arabs <coughs> practice their religion. Now, one thing that attracted the Africans was the fact that these Arabs will stop buying and selling the moment they call the azan, the call for prayer. The moment the call for prayer was made, these Arabs will stop everything they were doing. That was one thing that struck the Africans, that these people believe their God so strongly that they will stop every human activity to go and pray. So that began to influence some of the Africans. And some of the African nobles decided to link up with the Arabs. And of course, they gradually became Muslim. That's a very interesting pattern of conversion in the African context, in the sense that the African nobility became Muslim before the masses, which is not typical, because if you look at the history of Islam and Christianity, it's always the poor people, the rejected, who will join the religion. But in this particular case, the upper classes began to gravitate towards Islam, well, some would say, in retrospect, out of self-interest, because uh, it gave them power of literacy, it gave them access to a civilizational center, and all that. Some people have suggested this. But regardless of what was the motivation, the fact remains that through trade and commerce, Islam gradually gained ground among the African nobles. And of course, in ancient Ghana, which was still uh, a, a traditional African a kingdom with <laughs> idols and their own way of worshiping uh, uh, their, their, their creator uh, remain a non-Muslim state. But ancient Ghana was very much influenced by these Arab traders. Now, there are some scholars uh, who, who write from an African nationalist point of view who seem to suggest that in 1076, when ancient Ghana collapsed, it collapsed likely because the Arab Muslims' penetration of the region weakened the ideological foundation of the society. That's from a nationalist point of view. You still have some African nationalists who argue along those lines. There are some African Americans, uh, uh, Afrocentrics, who will argue along those lines. But the evidence really suggests that ancient Ghana itself was internally decaying, like all societies and civilization. And the coming of the Muslims in that part of the world helped accelerate the process. But the Muslim presence was not necessarily the cause of the collapse of ancient Ghana in 1076. Now, the other agency by which Islam spread, both in North Africa and in Sub-Saharan Africa, was through the establishment of Islamic ideological movements. 
and the first Islamic ideological movement which had impact not only in Africa but also in the Iberian Peninsula was the Al Mujah. Al Murabitun. The Murabitun movement really are the people of the Ribat. Now, this concept of a Ribat may sound very strange to modern day Americans, but medieval Christians had no problem with this concept because the Knight Templars fit the mold very well. The Ribat is a seminary, if you can imagine that today, which is very striking for an American, Seminary Cum Military Academy. <laughs> but you see, if you look at the mediv medieval world, the Knight Templars, they knew their Catholic catechism, they were very committed to Catholicism, but they were also warriors. You see what I'm saying? The Knight Templars. The Murabi Thun, where uh, this was a movement, but the Ribat and the Murabitun idea existed in Islam because the Murabitun were the border guards defending the frontiers of Islam uh, from alien intrusion, and they were supposed to know the religion and they were supposed to know how to fight to defend the religion. So they were the Murabitun, and of course, uh, a movement would call itself the Al Murabitun. You you read them in the Anglicized form, Al Muravits. You know, in English we read them as Muravits, M O R A V I D S, Muravits. But the Al Murabitun would play an important role in the spread of Islam south of the Sahara, because what happened really is that one of the Barba kings went on a pilgrimage to Mecca. And on his way back in what is now called Algeria, he, ha he asked one of the sheikhs whether he would accompany him back to his people because he was from the Barba tribal group called Sanhaja. The Sanhaja, Berber group. You have the Mesufa, the Godala, the Lemtuna, and other different groups. But he came out of the Sanhaja group. Now, he wanted a mentor and a teacher for his people so that they will have correct understanding of Islam. This person who was approached said, well, I cannot go with you. But I have a disciple called Abdullah ibn Yasin. And Abdullah ibn Yasin can come with you and he can teach your people. Now, Abdullah ibn Yasin was a very puritanical fellow. So when he came to these Barba people, he was so tough and strict in his understanding and interpretation of Islam that the Sanhaja people chase him out of town. <laughs> now, he went to, if you look at the map of Africa, you will see that, uh, there's just a rough map here. You have, the Senegalese are in that side of the wall here. There's the river here. Now, all this part, Morocco, Mauritania, part of Algeria, this became a kingdom in this area, big kingdom. Now, what is happening when, when he came down, Abdullah ibn Yasin, to preach to the Sanhaja people, and they chased him out of town, he went to the mouth of what is now called the Senegal River, which separated the Berbers from the sub Saharan uh, African groups, and he established a ribad. And that ribad would be the foundation for the Murabitun movement because they recruited all the able-bodied young men uh, from these tribal groups and they constituted his army. And he, with that army, he was able to conquer 
all of North Africa going all the way into Spain and the Murabi Tun invasion of Spain, which you read about. Now, what is very interesting about this is the fact that through the Al Murabi Tun movement, uh, you have greater Islamization of the North African and Sub Saharans who are exposed to the region. So many of these North Africans and Sub Saharan Africans became more exposed to Islam. But the point that needs to be emphasized here really is, like all revolutionary movements, after a few generations, some of them don't even last few generations, the revolution collapsed. We see that in the Soviet Union. It didn't last 70 years. I mean, you know, like, uh, uh, the, I mean, it lasted 70 years, but it didn't last 80, 100 years. I mean, from 1917 to 1989, it collapsed, communism collapsed. So the same thing happened with all movements, uh, human movements, at least what we know in history. They may last, some of them may last for 100 years, but eventually they collapse and uh, replaced by other movements. Now, this is precisely what happened to the Murabitun movement. The Murabitun movement uh, became dominant in North Africa and extended itself into Spain. But within a very short span of time, the Murabitun movement would collapse and would be replaced by another movement called the Al Muwahidun. This was in the 11th century. In 10, the Murabitun movement became very active by the 1070s. But by the 1120s, they were already less than 50 years, they were already gaining, losing ground to another movement, al Muwahidun, Just about 900 years ago, the, the al Muwahidun movement uh, would, they are the Unitarians. They emphasize Unitarianism, you know, in the Islamic context, because they felt that the Murabitun were deviationists, so they were applying corrective uh, teachings of Islam. So a new movement emerged called the Muwahidun. Now, the Muwahidun, of course, the triumph of the Muwahidun have serious consequences for Islamization in Africa, because what it means, many of these people who were identified with the Murabitun would now become refugees and they move south. And this is one of the reasons why, if you look at the, uh, the, the geography of names, south of the Sahara, and north of the Sahara, you will find that many of those towns immediately south of the Sahel carry names of some of the North African or Eastern Islamic names like Mecca, Medina, and many of these towns were established by these refugee intellectuals of the Murabi Tun. So these refugee intellectuals, there's a parallel. It's, it happened in, in American, European civilization and in American history. You have thousands of Jewish intellectuals who left Europe and came to America because of the Nazis. The same thing happened in, in, in terms of, uh, and there are many others. You have many Poles who left Poland and went to England. That's why you have some Englishmen with Polish last name. The same thing with Ital Italians, the movement of people. This, the same thing was happening here. Many of those uh, uh, Arab intellectuals who were identified with the Murabitun movement went south. And they, when they went south, they, of course, intermarry with some of the local people. And that's one of the reasons why if you go to sub-Saharan Africa, you find some sub-Saharan Africans who carry last names like Aydara, Sharif, just like the word Sharif in English, it's from the Arabic. The, the, you know, like the Sharif, the governor, the boss. So, I mean, you know, like uh, the Sharif of the town. So, I mean, you know, like uh, the, the, the Sharif and the Hyderas. So, if you go to West Africa, you take the telephone box, you will find many of those uh, West Africans who claim to be descendants of the Prophet. And they have last names like Hydera. You know, sometimes the French spells pronounce, the French, this is a French pronunciation, I mean, a spelling. But in the English speaking parts of Africa, they may use H-Y, you know, as opposed to A-I, D-A-R-A. -A. And then you have the Sharif, 
uh, in many of these uh, different countries. Now, what is interesting is that many of these refugees who came south of the Sahara and were actively involved in establishing Quranic schools would now become the purveyors of Islam south of the Sahara. So you now begin to see the so-called Afro-Arab connection between some of those African families and groups with the Arabs from the north. And you have many of them. And of course, from the history of Islam perspective, you have layers of these people. Uh, you have the more recent ones in African history, the children of the Syrians and Lebanese who came into West Africa since the 1890s. You have them. You go to Sierra Leone, you have thousands of Afro-Arab uh, Sierra Leoneans. <coughs> but these are the children of Lebanese and Syrians in recent generation. But you have longer generation, I mean, going hundreds of years ago, back, the first wave, who were really the offsprings of this Murabithun movement, the refugees who came south and established Quranic schools and established towns and villages uh, in the Arabic tradition. And that's one reason why you find the problem in Sudan right now, you know, like because you have those, it, the process of course took place much later in Sudan because the Islamization and Arabization of what is now called the Republic of Sudan is much later than what we are talking about today because Sudan continued to have uh, Christian civilizations in Nubia up until the 15th century. But since the 15th century, of course, the Nubian towns uh, and, uh, and all those Christian kingdoms in what is now called Sudan disappeared and were replaced by Arabic-speaking Islamic states in that part of the world. I think this is very important for us to understand when we uh, look at these movements and the manner in which these movements impacted on African societies. So the Murabithun built on that legacy of the Arab traders who travel with their camels south of the Sahara. The only difference here is that they became a fighting force and were able to expand their conquest, not south of the Sahara, but north of the Sahara and then into Spain. And many of the sub-Saharan Africans who were gradually becoming part of the Islamic fold were involved in that process. And that's why you have some of them who found themselves in Spain, especially among the Fulani people from where Abdullah ibn Yasin built his al murabitun movement. Now, besides these two agencies, the Arab merchant as a purveyor of Islamic values and these Islamic groups, I mean, puritanical Islamic movements like the murabitun and the Muwahidun, we also had an other agency which was responsible for the penetration of Islam south of the Sahara and north of the Sahara. And that is the emergence in the 17th, 18th century of what is called the Sufi Brotherhoods. I'm sure you're familiar with these Sufis. Now, the Sufi orders would play a very important role in the dissemination of Islam in the Muslim world. Virtually in almost all parts of the Muslim world, you had Sufi orders, and they played a very important role in the dissemination of Islamic values and culture. Now, in sub-Saharan Africa and in North Africa, Sufism would travel from the East, in Iraq, Syria, Egypt, to <coughs> Spain, and then from Spain to North Africa. Now, these Sufi orders from North Africa would gradually find their way into Sub-Saharan African region. And of course, the Sufi group that was most instrumental in bringing Sufism to Sub-Saharan Africans was the Khadiriya order. Khadiriya order. Now, if you are reading the literature, you will know that there is an Iraqi by the name of 
Abdul Qadir Jailani. Now, now we know that he was a cut. Abdul Qadir Jailani, but of course he didn't see himself as a cut the way cuts now see themselves, because this whole idea of being a Kurdish nationalist did not exist because they all saw themselves as Muslims and they spoke Arabic. They have their own languages, but they did not identify in a nationalistic sense the way human groups identify nationalistically because they were part of Islam. And of course, at that time, uh, the dominant ideology was Islamism and they see themselves in that light. This Abdul Khari Jailani, the Iraqi today, we see him as an Iraqi, but he didn't see himself as Iraqi at all. I mean, you know, like he lived in Baghdad because in those days, Arabs do not identify themselves in terms of, they identify in terms of towns. That's why you can see that in their last names. I mean, uh, they, I'm from Mansouri, I'm from Baghdadi, I'm from, you know, Damascene, uh, al Qahirin. you know, the last names, they, they can tell you where they come from, but they don't tell themselves that we are from Syria or these are concepts that came much later. But, you know, like uh, they didn't see themselves that way. So the... Uh, from what we now call Iraq, they were able to move uh, his ideas spread across the Muslim world. And of course, some of these Sufis who embrace his ideas would now begin to spread them south of the Sahara. So gradually, the Khadiriya order became established in Morocco, in Algeria, and of course, through the Trans-Saharan trade, the merchants brought the ideas to Sub-Saharan region. Yes? How were the Sufis different in practice from uh, the other Muslims? Well, the Sufis, uh, one of the distinct uh, uh, characteristics of the Sufis is that in addition to the mosque or the masjid, the Sufis have what they call zawiyah. Some people translate it as a lodge, just like the Masons have their lodge. And of course, there are different names that I use. People from Southeast Asia, South, South Asia, they, they, they use other words like teke, you know, different words you know, in, in different parts of the Muslim world. But in Northwest Africa and in Sub-Saharan Africa, the word zawiya is used by the Sufis to describe the place where they can congregate and do their zikr, you know, celebrating the praise of God. Now, this Zawiyah becomes very important uh, link for the Sufis because many Sufis who were business people could find accommodation in the Zawiyah because when you are a member of these uh, orders, you belong to this fraternity or sorority of some sort, and they look after you. So you could travel for a thousand miles, and you would be sure of place to stay when you go to a mosque or a zawiya, because you know that people with whom you will spend part of the day, if not most of the day, singing praises to God are members of your Sufi order. You see what I'm saying? Now, the Orthodox Muslims who don't engage in zikr, uh, like the Sufis, they don't have any idea of a zawiya. There is no zawiya for them. Uh, they have the masjid, and they just go and pray. But they don't engage in any kind of Sufi rituals. I describe the Sufis, and some of them say they like that characterization. The Sufis are Muslims who like to do overtime. <laughs> you see, so I mean, you know, like, because every Muslim is supposed to do nine to five, but they want to go beyond the call of duty and do overtime, because that's, that, that's what the Sufis really try to do. So they, 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 they have their sawiyas or take care or whatever. And in the West African or Sub-Saharan African context, what you have to recognize is the fact that the Khadiriya, the Tijaniya is another one, Tijaniya, which was founded by an Algerian called Sheikh Ahmed Al-Tijani. I mean, you can see the last name from Tijani. 
you know, the area he came from. It's like you're from New York, Al New Yorki. You may have Musa Al New Yorki, or, <laughs> you know, like, uh, I mean, the Arabs also, you know, he's from Detroit. They may, you know, like you have many Arabs in Detroit, you know, or in Dearborn, Al Dearborni, you know, like, so you have, uh, I mean, you know, identify you in terms of where you came from. So the Sufis were people who differentiated themselves from the other Muslims by doing what I call over time. They engage in zikr and other things that the orthodox Muslims f either frown upon or feel they are not obligated to do. So the, the Rumi was of the Sufi brotherhood, wasn't he? Yeah, Rumi, yes. He was, he's one of the most famous Sufis. Okay, so they were kind of like monks in that tradition. Well, more if you, if you use the term monk, you complicate the process. I mean, uh, because the monks have celibacy which the Sufis don't practice. You see, the Sufis engage in meditation. They have individual or group meditation. You can go into Halwa, where you will really engage yourself in very isolated, elaborate, meditative exercise. Or you can engage in what they call waziva. You may have a number of members of your brotherhood or sisterhood in this case, and you will form circles and you will do the zikr. You know, the, each order has its own set of rituals, separate and distinct from the others. They have certain things in common, like the zikr. Some of them do zikr quietly, like the Khadiriyas. Some of them do zikr loudly, like the Tijaniyas. And some of them, they combine their worship with drums, you see, and of course you, you hear in the West more about the so-called whirling dervishes. I mean, you know, like, uh, and they do their dances, you know, like, you see that more in Central Asia and the Balkan area and Andalusia, you know, the Turks, you find some of that kind of Sufism. And of course you go to India and Pakistan and other areas, they combine uh, the Sama, what they call Sama, you know, like they have their traditional pre-Islamic musical instruments uh, which they now use in the name of Islam and in the celebration of Sufi. And of course they call it Sama and the Hawali and all that. So, I mean, they, you have different ways. Uh, and of course, some of the Orthodox scholars are very suspicious of the Sufi practices. And, uh, uh, and of course, in the United States, I have added one, voca one word to the vocabulary of Sufi studies in this country, what I call the popcorn Sufis. <laughs> you know, like, uh, because, you know, you, you have the popcorn Sufi. I mean, uh, the popcorn Sufi in the American context are people in the United States who do not fully accept Islam in terms of a belief system, but they embrace partially some aspect of Sufism and will identify themselves as Sufis. And you have people like that. They are very much in the New Age group. You know, those are the popcorn Sufis. Because, you know, like I arrived at this almost 20 years ago when a friend of mine uh, in Washington uh, said to me, she said that uh, her sister called her one day and said to her, guess what? She said, guess what? Said, I'm a Sufi. Now this friend of mine, she is very knowledgeable of Islam. So when the sister called her and told her this, that she is a Sufi, and she asked her, what do you do? She said, well, you know, we hold hands and we sit on the grass and we say, Allah, Allah, Allah. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, like, uh, then I, that was the time the, the thought came to me. I told her, well, your sister really is a popcorn Sufi. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, like, and it's talk now. You know, now anyone who really has this new age attitude about Islam, but does not want to go through the five daily, I mean, the five pillars of Islam, you know, praying and fasting and doing all that. I mean, you have some pseudo-Islamic practices about you, you are a popcorn Sufi. That, that's what, that's what, that's what I'm, I, I hope I clarify for you. But in the old days, it was just the men who were the Sufi Brotherhood, right? No, 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 no. You have Rabia, you have some very famous uh, Sufi women. Yeah, there were some very famous Sufi women, uh, mystics. You know, you know, sometimes we use the term mystics to describe the Sufis there, that the Islamic, that's the mystical dimension of Islam. Yes, please. 
Um, in the Sufi tradition, um, just to clarify for myself, they took a very strict, what you would call, vow of poverty, where they would, and part of their learning process was traveling, was the journey, which was the allegory for the spiritual journey. And then you would learn, you would learn, you would come to enlightenment through doing the journey and dealing with other people and teaching them. So is that kind of like uh, different from what you would call traditional Islam in the sense that these were, these were people who traveled and taught, actually taught people through parables or fables? Yes, I mean, uh, the, the definitely m most of the Sufi masters in the past did recognize that this world here is very temporary. So for that reason, they were not enamored with this world. Now, there were some Sufis who felt that you should try your very best to take your portion of this world. Because they remember the prayers of the Prophet, which says that, you know, Rabbana Atina Fi Dunya Hasanat, and then, you know, like you want God to give you success in this life, but you also pray for success in the next life. And you also ask God not to punish you in your grave when you are judged for what you have done on this earth. Now, those Sufi masters who took the vow of poverty saw themselves in the light you described. Just like Francis of Assisi, you know, you take po poverty and say, well, we are going to serve God and we are not, we will turn away from the world and we will turn towards our Creator. So you take that decision. And then they draw that analogy between the road to poverty, self-consciously now. It's just, it's, it's, this is not something you just say, accept. You consciously decide that you are going to behave as if this world does not matter. And you are not going to engage in any kind of accumulation of wealth. Now, but there are Sufi masters who don't take that position. They feel that you can be as successful in this world without being completely uh, absorbed. You have, well, you know, like the Christians have a saying, be in this world, but not be of this world. You see, that kind of concept. Uh, you have <clears throat> that understanding among some of the Sufis. So not all Sufis want to live the life of poverty. No, not all Sufis. You have Sufis who feel that you can be very successful, you can be middle class, upper class, and be successful materially, so long as you are not a prisoner of desire, prisoner of materialism. So, I mean, uh, you have some Sufis who, who came along those, uh, 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 that line. But going back to the Sufis as agents for Islamization in North Africa as well as Sub-Saharan Africa, we identify the Tijaniya, the Khadiriya. You have a group that is peculiar to the Republic of Senegal uh, in Northwest Africa called the Muridiya. Now, many of these orders are in the United States already. They have branches in the United States. Now, you have uh, a, a number of other groups, uh, the Ahmadiyya, uh, you know, uh, all over you have the Sanusiya. The Sanusiya really was identified with Libya and you find it in Chad and some of the other areas. The Sanusiya dynasty was ruling Libya before Gaddafi carried out his military coup. And of course, you go to Sudan, you have the Ansar, the Mirghaniya, the Zadziliya, you have many others. So if you read books like J.S. Trimingham, Sufi orders in Islam, you will come across many of these groups. Uh, and there are many other books about Sufi groups, uh, that are uh, in Africa. And there are studies done on individual Sufi orders in Africa, whether it is in Morocco, in Algeria, in Egypt, in Libya, in Sudan, in East Africa, West Africa. There are a lot of studies. If you are interested in this aspect of Islam, uh, you can read a number of books along those lines. Now, of course, one can spend hours, if not days, just talking about Sufism, but we don't have the time. So I will go on to the other agency that contributed to Islamization of Africa, south of the Sahara, especially in this case. Because <clears throat> by the time 
we come to the 1500s, because by 1440s, from our history of Africa and history of Western exploration, we already see that the Arab and the Muslims were already dominant in the Mediterranean. Arabic was the international language of the world at that time. Just like once upon a time Greek was, once upon a time Latin was, today English is. <coughs> now, at that particular moment in time, in the 15, 1400s, just around the time when Prince Henry, who later got the sobriquet navigator, started sending his mariners out of the southern port of Portugal called Lagos. Now, Prince Henry would assemble all the talents he could lay his hands on in Europe as well as in the Mediterranean region. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. If you have the talent, we need you. And he was able to get all these groups to help him, just like the American administration of Eisenhower and Kennedy got all these fellows like Von Braun and all those scientists to help the space program. The same thing was done by him. So he was able to get all the brains he could get to help him create this naval academy in the southern tip of Portugal. Now, as a result of his success, he was able to send out mariners to go and explore the West African coastline. Because up until his decision to establish this naval academy and to send explorers, no one, to our knowledge, was able to sail south of Cape Bojado. We have the story of Hano, the Carthaginian, who supposedly traveled south of Cape Bojado and explore some regions of Africa. We have that in, this, in some of the history books. But the evidence is not very convincing that he actually did that. But the account from Henry the Navigator, we know for sure, because we have ample evidence now that the Portuguese did travel south of Cape Bojado. The Portuguese were able to do it because they came up with new innovative vessels, the caravel. And the caravel, of course, would enable them to travel south of Cape Bojado. The point that you have to bear in mind really is that the, is the movement of the winds. If your boat comes south of Cape Bojado, it was very difficult for the oaksmen to row their boat up. So the Portuguese were able to develop a technique of navigating these waters so that they would be able to sail south and then come back. And of course, this would set the stage for the later expeditions across the Atlantic. Because people like Columbus spent many years on the West African coast before they traveled to the Americas. Now, the point that we need to bear in mind here is that as a result of the gradual penetration of the West African coast by the Portuguese, the Muslims began to lose control. I see the time. <laughs> the Muslims began to lose control over the Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean was no longer the monopoly of the Muslims and the Arabs. And gradually, the European powers were able to explore this West African coastline. And on th of course, you know that Bartholomew Dias and Vasco da Gama would be the two Portuguese marinas who successfully circumnavigated the Cape of Good Hope towards East Africa and India. This will change world history. Just like the Sputnik of the Russians, and the challenge it posed to America in terms of Apollo expedition, and then later the eagle has landed. So, I mean, the same kind of situation was happening in a different way, but similar. The Portuguese navigation of the African coastline 
to the Cape of Good Hope broke Muslim monopoly of world trade. Because now Europeans could bypass the Muslim strongholds in the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and the Indian Ocean. They could now go all the way to the Indian Ocean and compete for access to the spices of Asia. This changed world history. That's how world history changed over the last 400 years. And the balance of power shifted from the Mediterranean people. Because the Mediterranean people, whether they were Jews, Persians, Chaldeans, Babylonians, Sumerians, they dominated the world. But power now shifted to the European people. And the last Mediterranean people to Hegel, as Hegel would say, the universal spirit takes a westerly direction. So, I mean, you know, like that, so the universal spirit was moving. The people of the East were dominant, but then gradually it was moving towards the Western people. And of course, the last 500 years proved that to the point that the last Mediterranean people who were dominant after taking power from the Jews, the Greeks, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, and others, were the Portuguese and the Spaniards. And today they are at the bottom in the European pyramid. 500 years. Power shift. You see what I'm saying? Go ahead. I want to just clarify the name of that vessel was a caravel? Yeah, the caravel. C A R A V E L L E. Yeah, Caravel. That was a revolution. Just like this, you know, now we have the Americans are leading the world today, so they are inventing new things, uh, you know, and, and computers and other things. Yeah, that's what happened in history, yeah. Who were the years for the Sufi orders? The, the centuries for the Sufi yeah, orders? Yeah, the Sufi orders came to Africa here in the 16th, I mean 17th century, what you would call 1600s. From that time on, they were already, you know, Exposed. They came into Spain before the collapse of the Muslims in Spain, but they did not move south until later. They came to sub-Saharan Africa in the 16th, 17th century. So by the 17th century, the Sufi orders were already in North Africa. So by the time the Portuguese were whittling away at the Islamic courts on the African coastline, the Sufis were already the there. That's right. The Sufis were already established in North Africa, and they were gradually now penetrating sub-Saharan Africa. But they will become more visible, and this coincided with the European presence already. By the 18th century, just around the time of the War of Independence, the Sufi groups were already established, and they were now beginning to take over some of these centers of power. Time, she is giving the signal. So, you know, like, uh, but we will have another hour or so to do. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.